After three years and a lot of money, the Michigan Attorney General squeals the brakes on the Flint water investigation and vows to start over. That comes as a new report may change our understanding of what happened and how bad it was. And the growing pains in Eastern Market. Can it stay the same and yet improve at the same time? Today is Sunday, June 16, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. All right, welcome to Flashpoint. And if you live in Flint, you certainly feel like we hit another Flashpoint last week in that city's long-running odyssey. On Thursday, Attorney General Dana Nessel announced she's dropping all of the standing charges in the Flint water investigation and basically rebooting the entire thing. She had already dispatched Todd Flood as the special prosecutor and replaced him with her own team of Fadwa Hamoud and Kim Worthy. But this was no doubt a slap at the way the investigation had been handled by her predecessor, Bill Schuette. May have also been that she saw the cases might be on shakier ground than she'd like, and she wants another and perhaps even broader run at those deemed responsible. But it came just after a new report from researchers at Virginia Tech that might put a new spin on the science, the lead in the water readings at the very heart of the entire ordeal. Among the findings, that the highest lead levels might actually have been from before Flint's water, which switched over to the Flint River. How's that possible? And what would that mean for the restart of the prosecution? It is a lot to sort through. And coming up this morning, we'll try to get to the bottom of it with Mark Edwards, one of those researchers from Virginia Tech, who will talk about their new findings. And a little later on, we're going to continue our examination of the state of affairs at Eastern Market. Can a resurgent Detroit keep its authentic heart and soul in places like the market? It's all today on Flashpoint. Quite a week in the Flint water crisis with Dana Nessel dropping the existing charges against eight different defendants, including the state's former health director. Has a lot of Flint residents today confused and voicing frustration as the clock resets. Uh, but this morning, I want to turn our attention to the release of a new study on the causes and depths of the crisis. The latest finding from Mark Edwards and Sid Arthur Roy, two Virginia Tech researchers who studied the sludge in the Flint water system and found what they say is the first real evidence that corrosive of water led to elevated lead levels in Flint's children, but it includes other findings which are surprising. And Dr. Mark Edwards joins us from Blackburg, Virginia this morning. Dr. Edwards, I really appreciate your time. I want to start, if you could, I, I think I, I, I'll just let you react to what you were thinking as you heard last week that the charges had been dropped and the uh, Michigan Attorney General was starting everything over. Well, I was disappointed that the cases were handed to her in the fashion that they were, in the state they were. We've been outspoken about some of the prosecution's theories, their witness uh, credibility, and also the lack of evidence. And so I think that this is probably a good thing overall because it's quite likely one of the cases would have been dismissed today uh, for all the reasons we just mentioned. Well, then I'm wondering if you think then that the, this new research that you've brought forward as you studied, uh, you kind of had to go back and look at sludge levels in the sewer system uh, to kind of try and rebuild what had happened years ago. I'm wondering if you think that there are implications of your research now for the way that the case should be prosecuted. Well, I, I don't think so. What our results really did is confirm the data of Dr. Mona Hanatish and our prior conceptualization that the blood lead of children roughly doubled in the summer after the switch. And we've always maintained that what happened in Flint was a crime, uh, specifically by the employees of Michigan Department of Environmental Quality who failed to implement corrosion control that, that caused this. But at the same time, the data also answers questions about what we didn't know before. Recall uh, the samples collected of the water were, were cheated, basically. They were illegal. And so we didn't know what was happening in the water. And so we looked at the sewage sludge because all the drinking water goes into the sewage with the idea that maybe that could reveal the unknown and explain, resolve some of the uncertainties. And it did. And what it showed is that the levels of exposure weren't as bad as we initially had feared, and that indeed Flint had probably had lead in water problems even, even before the water crisis. So to say that it was not as bad as uh, you once feared, uh, how should, if I live in Flint, what are you saying to me and how should I take that? 
Well, we still feel that the water elevated the blood lead of children, especially in the summer after the switch occurred, and that what happened was a crime. It never should have happened. It was a failure of government at all levels. But at the same time, in the absence of data, some people jumped to the conclusion that all kids had been harmed very seriously, or in some cases, even all kids had been brain damaged. Obviously, that, that is not the case at all. Uh, what our data showed was that the elevations that occurred were not much higher than what was considered normal about five or six years earlier. That's not to excuse the fact that blood leads were elevated and we do feel that this is a crime, but it's important to keep this in, in perspective. Well, and, and part of that perspective, uh, when your paper said that the highest levels that you could actually find were from 2011, well before the switch to the Flint River had ever been made, um, does that change culpability in all of this? And what does that mean uh, long term and, and, and as you try to piece together the whole story of what happened in Flint? Yeah, I don't, we don't think it changes culpability. Uh, we think this was, was criminal, that people should be punished for what happened. But it does put it into some perspective that uh, the damage to children, the damage to the average person in Flint was not as bad as some of the media outlets had portrayed it as. Uh, and so, you know, we really filled in a, a great unknown here because a lot of the angst was coming from the fact that there was no good lead in water data, and we've actually uh, filled that in really remarkably. And we have, a, we have a picture of the Flint water crisis that, frankly, isn't what we thought it would be at first, but it's, it's remarkably consistent with the trends in children's blood lead. And so together, I think it tells the story at least of the lead exposure during the Flint water crisis. Well, and, and, and you mentioned earlier that it still means that a lot of people are, are culpable for what they did. Last year, you felt that the blame did not rely so much with Health and Human Services, uh, but uh, more with the uh, DEQ, which has now, of course, uh, undergone a, a name change, but the department remains the same. Uh, it, has this finding changed where you think the culpability is? and? Do you think it stops at the governor's door, or does it go into the governor as well? Well, all of the data that we have seen, that we uncovered in our Freedom of Information Act request and posted on our website, uh, frankly, that was the data that was used at the prosecution. We didn't see much additional evidence. And based on our conclusion, and anyone can read it and make their own conclusions, we decided that the culpability really rested with a few engineers and scientists at the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality who had complete responsibility for corrosion control, had complete responsibility for this law, lied about it in writing to the EPA, misled people. Uh, and so if that's not criminal, I don't know what is. But amongst the people they misled included the mayor of Flint and uh, nearly everyone else who was looking into this matter. And so it's one thing to tell a lie and another thing to believe a lie. And folks can, you know, look at the emails that we gathered and make their own decisions. Uh, and uh, lastly, your thoughts that, uh, on this matter w w with regards to the governor's culpability himself. We saw this past week that uh, Dana Nessel had subpoenaed his, uh, his phone, which he said he had already turned in long ago. So obviously this is a matter they're looking into. Well, we really look at the facts, and you always have to be open to the idea that some evidence could be forthcoming tomorrow. But here we are, some two and a half years into this investigation, and the evidence that I saw in relation to Dr. Wells and Mr. Lyon and Mr. Snyder doesn't come close to anything that looks like guilt or direct culpability to me. We've we said they were certainly overly trusting of these engineers and scientists who were lying to anyone who was asking questions. Uh, but, you know, as we said, it's one thing to believe a lie and another one to tell one yourself. Yeah. Well, it's obviously a, a fascinating new chapter that you provided to an already very lengthy book. Dr. Mark Edwards at Virginia Tech University, I really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, we'll talk more about this as we continue. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Back with more in just a minute.